amazing and cool project. All right. Well, thank you very much. So I'm really thrilled to be here to talk to you about our project, which really came together last July. And I represent our entire team, but it is this huge team effort that, as, as Phyllis said, spans pretty much all across campus and all the way to Tanzania. And we're coming together to solve one of those problems that almost every museum has, and that's connecting an object to all of the information that it represents. More specifically, natural history museums draw hundreds of millions of people every year, or uh, over many years, but I love this picture because this is the Field Museum in Chicago on opening day, May 2nd, 1921, so over 100 years ago. And in these museums, you can have foundational educational experiences that have led to many STEM careers. That's why I'm standing in front of you right now, because this is how I got my start. This got me thinking about the past and how to bring that to help understand where we're going. Within these natural history museums, one of the biggest draws are prehistoric animals, largely because they're big. They invoke imagination of something you just can't see, specifically one of those that most of us probably know is Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the biggest carnivores of all time. But one of the big challenges we have is that this is a skeleton of an animal that lived 66 million years ago, but the only information about it right here at the museum is just a little panel. And there's only so much you can put on that panel. You can talk about where it was found, you can talk about who named it, but most of the information that is T-Rex and what it represents on our planet is gone. We don't see the information about how it looked, what its teeth were like, and how those teeth actually were used, where it's from, places like Montana, South Dakota, and what the environment would have looked like 66 million years ago in the northern part of North America. So our project is to bring all of these details and be in between the physical skeleton and all that information. So we're creating a digital platform that you can use the physical skeleton to access all this information that is critical for understanding T-Rex's place and Earth history that we all share. So our primary goal in this project is to close that gap between the static skeletons that we see in museums all over and have a way to deliver a wealth of information. Again, there's this disconnect between the animal or the exhibit itself and all that information, and a lot of that's on the internet, but it's really hard to find. So our goal is to connect that in that place and beyond. So with that in mind, we have two major goals in this project, and one is to create a digital skeleton that's the centerpiece for an immersive educational experience something that you can experience in a museum or beyond the museum anywhere in the world. And what we're trying to do by creating that, by creating that digital skeleton, we can make a physical 3D printed skeleton from that and use that as a guide to get all of this information in one place. Our secondary goal is to release everything so anyone can access this in the world. So for me as a paleontologist, the bones of these animals are only in one place in one part of the world. But when you digitize them, someone can look at them in 3D and download them and print them out almost instantaneously. Not only is it the specific bones that we can print out, but in this case, we'll have a skeleton and parts of the skeleton and everything associated with that animal will all be available. So those are our two goals. Our vehicle for this project is an animal called Teleocrater radinus, which we named in 2017, so it's a pretty new animal. It is not a dinosaur, but it is the great, 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 great dinosaurs. 
It is one of the oldest relatives of dinosaurs that we've ever found. It's from Tanzania, so in East Africa. And what's really great is almost all the bones of that animal are here on campus. Those belong to the people of Tanzania, so we're taking care of them, we're cleaning them, we extracted them, and they'll all go back after this process. The bones of the animal are actually pretty small, so Telio Crater isn't one of the giants, but to get this project done, the animal itself is only about six or seven feet long, and most of that's tail. So that's why we chose this animal. But also, we know that it tells a great story, right? It doesn't necessarily look like a dinosaur. It's got hallmarks of a dinosaur, but it has a lot of tales to tell about how dinosaurs arose um, about 230 million years ago from something that looks a bit more like a crocodile on stilts. So Telio Crater is here, scan all of the bones, assemble this great team, as, as Phyllis said, so I won't spend too much time here. The team works together to bring all of these different groups to um, analyze and work together how to make this happen, which for me is a great learning experience because I spend most of my time thinking about how this animal tells stories, but to get those stories out there takes everyone else in this team, and we're combining how to tell these stories with videos and drone footage and interviews with scientists to the actual object, which we'll show a little bit later. Not only do we have a, a great team of, of people that do this professionally, but underlying all of these teams are a huge group of students which have been driving a lot of the innovation and putting everything together to help us out. So we've got this great team that works together and hopefully over the next semester or at, towards the end of this semester, we'll get even more synergy between the students across all of these parts of the project so they can see how all these different pieces come together. All right, so now I just wanted to go over a little bit of the process that we've been going through. After these fossils have been extracted, they come into the geoscience building where our, where our labs are. We clean the fossils. Once they're clean, we take them over to the library and they get digitized. They get digitized using high, high fidelity surface scanners that not only record the shape down to way below a millimeter, but it also records the texture and the color of these bones. So it's not exactly the same as holding the bone in your hand, but it's as close as you can get, and those files can be fired off to anyone in the world. So these are, bones are scanned. They're put into a digital environment where they are exactly the same size as the original bone. From there, we start doing a little bit of reconstruction. We take those original bones and using our skills of anatomy and digital sculpting, we can assemble those bones into an entire skull. So this is the skull of Telio Crater. This was done in ZBrush a couple weeks ago. And this is the highest resolution we can have. So this skull right here is something like 4.5 million polygons. So we keep the highest resolution, but then we can't use that in the platform in the AR applications that we want to use because they're too big. And to explain this process, we have a number of students right here that will talk about some of these challenges. Um, hi, I'm Zach Kim. I'm one of the project managers with the Aries Lab and the Library Services, and these are, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Emma. I'm one of the uh, art 3D object modelers on the team. I'm a senior of CT at here at Virginia Tech. My name is Neha. I'm also a senior at Virginia Tech, and I'm also one of the 3D modelers on this project. Yeah, and there's a lot of other people on our team, but we are the ones who are here. Um, and so they're just going to talk, we're just going to talk really quick about our process of taking the high fidelity scans and um, uh, putting them through a process to be used in AR. And so the first step is taking that high poly into making it um, this like low poly you see in the right. 
right? Yes. Um, and explain that will be Neha. I mean, sorry, Emma. That's yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so like Dr. Nesbitt was saying, when the bones first come to us, there are like millions and millions of polygons. And of course, um, most like modern day like AR and computers like can't handle that much information like very quickly. So it's our job to kind of take it into ZBrush and bring the bones down to like a poly level that would be able to work in a AR related environment and can go across like multiple platforms. And so we'll bring it in, we'll decimate some of it, get rid of some of those polygons, like fix it up, and then we take the, um, the textures that come along with it and make sure that they still fit everything and then we send it over to be textured, which Neha will explain more about. Let me go to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so the next part of the 3D process is putting the textures on, and like Emma was saying, sometimes we preserve the textures, um, sometimes we aren't able to, so we actually made this uh, 3D texture that we put on to the low poly, so first we do the baking and then we can put on the smart material and it basically like emulates the dirty bone texture. Um, so combined with the files that we got from Dr. Nesbitt, we use both the, um, the texture files and the smart material to create like a unified skeleton. Yeah, and I think the next slide will show um, a video of, this is a bone ready in AR, and um, later on today, y'all be able to look on your phones and see um, it rotating around. Um, but this is the low poly with um, the high poly texture baked on it, as Neha just explained. Um, and so that's kind of like our process from getting it from a high poly, high fidelity scan, getting a low poly and baking those textures on. Um, and then you get something like this. Thank you thanks, very thanks much. Thanks for having us. We're going to walk back now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to be combining that with lots of questions that can connect the physical model, the digital model, with its paleobiology. And we have a number of questions that can be followed. So this is where that educational material that is mostly lost comes together. So here are a couple examples. What did it eat? We can, animate the anim we can animate the animal biting something. We can actually reconstruct its brain from the internal spaces within the bones. We can show, we can put scales and muscles on it to show what the head would have looked like, and maybe even take the entire skeleton and make it move, which has its challenges, but it's something we would all like to see. So that's the paleobiology of the animal, but we can go further. We can talk about the discovery process. We can talk about us being in Tanzania. There's Michelle cleaning off some bones in 2017 from where Telio Crater actually came from. We can talk to Tanzanians about where these fossils came from, why paleontology is really important in Tanzania and what the region is like, all the way to the cleaning of the bones in our lab here with one of our uh, paleontology preparators cleaning the teeth of this animal. So we can ask all these questions and by clicking on them, they can get more information if they would like it. So it's a way to explore beyond just the bones there. Then we've got a couple other kinds of, um, other kinds of information we can have like paleo context, so widening it out. Why is this animal important? Recreating the environment. So Telio Crater just didn't live alone. It had uh, relatives of mammals around. It lived in a forest, which is not like Tanzania right now, and so on and so on. And we can show how Tanzania today is in a very different spot than it was 230, 240 million years ago. And finally, as we go through this process, we can document how we're doing the digital reconstruction. Where are the questions that we still have? How do we make something from just a few bones? And we can show that most animals that we have on our planet that are extinct are only known by a certain percent. The skeletons that you see in museums that are fully there, most of that is based off of reconstructed material. They don't come out of the ground that way, and we can show that. All right, a little bit about the platform. So one of our big challenges 
is to get all this information in there and have it run on uh, tablets or phones easily. One way that we deal with not having to update lots and lots of different systems is having it through Play Canvas, through WebXR. So no matter what kind of device you have, it should be able to work so we don't have to keep updating things. The, I, I don't know all the details here, but the most important part is, is to balance the information, so no information overload, with what can actually be seen. So this is the platform that we're gonna use, and what we're working towards is being able to use the camera on the phone to recognize shapes of the bones of physical models to take you directly into the digital, digital environment through this kind of application. All right, and as we're finishing up, we haven't gotten there quite yet, but I've got an example of the Telio Crater skull right here. So this is what you just saw. This is actual size. So ma imagine having the, the skeleton behind this. Our final product, our physical product, will be a printed out skeleton. And we'll actually engineer this so it can be put together from anyone in the world. So we'll engineer holes through the skeleton to add supports. There'll be a way of mounting it in different positions. And our ultimate place for the skull of Telio Crater, besides the Museum of Geosciences on our campus, is the Field Museum, after 100 years after it opened, and the Natural History Museum in London, which is the most visited natural history museum in the world. So we might have a very large audience that will be able to see what we have done at Virginia Tech. All right, just a couple notes. Here we are with the project. We've modeled many of the bones. We have almost all the bones in a 3D environment. We're working on the application. And really the last part we have not done is that full 3D printing in the physical model and exhibit that will go to these other museums. So we've made a lot of progress, still have a lot to make, but we wanna use this as a jumping off point for other kinds of extinct animals. So this is the, the, I guess, the guinea pig for trying to expand this program to many museums. So getting back to our outcomes, I wanted to show an example of what we thought when we started this. We want people to interact with the physical skeleton in a physical space, but be able to take it to a digital space which contains all that information. So you can scan it, scan a skeleton as you walk around it. You'll be able to see all that information that is usually lost or in places all over the web or not available at all. And lastly, all of these bones, the original bones in their highest, uh, highest fidelity that we have, will be available to anyone, anywhere, so they can actually print out these bones and touch Telio Crater. And for many of these people, it would be the first time, given that almost all the bones are just right here. So with that, I would like to thank ICAT for funding our project and all the support that we've had over the last eight months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sterling. Let me, before we get to questions, I, f I missed one announcement and I apologize. Uh, there's a future body symposium and exhibition coming up from the New Media Caucus. Uh, submission deadline has been extended to March 22nd on that. There's some papers here where you can learn more about that. I'll leave that there. Thank you. Okay, Telio Crater, wow. Um, I, wanna, I wanna, before we get into any other question, I wanna, I wanna say one. So you kind of glossed over that we named this in 2017. Can, can you talk about that process a little bit and who we is? Because it's not like we like the scientific community, it's like we in this room <laughs> named a new species, so. Yeah, the, the team consisted of scientists from, from all over the world. So the story goes back to the 1930s when the bones of this animal were first found in Tanzania, but they were in the Natural History Museum in London and they were studied by someone that never published it. And he passed away in the late 90s, 
and we went back to the same area, and we don't know exactly where those original bones came from in 1930, but we had a dot on a map, and that dot was the size of about a kilometer across when we actually got there, and we happened to find an area, what we call a bone bed, where there's lots of bones coming out of the rock, and we found the rest of Telio Crater. We don't know if that's the exact site, but we did find <laughs> bones that are definitely the same species, and what we did find were parts of the missing skeleton that was originally in London. Many, many other parts, like there were no skull parts for that original skeleton. And with that, we combined it all together and named it Telio Crater, which was the original name proposed by the person that originally studied the material but never published it. So a little, little how science works. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> anyway, I'm so excited to share this. What other questions do we, what questions do we have in the room? Well, first, yeah, this was a fantastic presentation. It's a, such a terrific project um, for so many reasons. Um, but bridging between the science and education through art is, is just, this is really neat. And I always ask this question, or I ask it quite a bit, of when you go through this kind of process, and you now have pretty much developed a pipeline between the, the bones all the way to the AR digital artifacts, do you think that there's opportunities, or maybe even has it already happened, of learning something new as a scientist in this process, not merely conveying it to all the, the people that'll go to these museums, but um, to the science community as well? Yeah, absolutely. Putting the skull together taught me about proportions of the skull, because we only have seven, six or seven bones of the skull, and what you're seeing in the skull where it's rougher, these are the real bones, but they're mirrored, so we only have one side. So how those proportions work out gives us an overall shape of what the animal would look like. And this is a carnivorous animal, but it's not like a dinosaur skull. And through that digital sculpting, I was able to figure out how far this joint was in the back, where the teeth are located, things like that. And that you don't really think about as much unless you have to recreate the parts that are not there. So. Excellent, thank you. What and while questions? I'm doing that though, we do have a demo that we can use to see some of this AR in reality. So we've got a couple examples back here. Okay. And I believe you can scan this See if you can do it with your phone and see where to go. And these are markers that should be able to take you to the skull, right, Zach? Yeah, all right. And then, of course, you're welcome to come up after that, after that and see the physical model of the skull. So much fun. Are there questions in the room? And I'll check online as well. I'll come to you, Todd. Oh, thank you. So other than date, um, which you get through your typical means, I assume, how do we know this is not a dinosaur and how is it different from a dinosaur? I know it's a little bit of a very specific nerdy dinosaur question, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, no, that, so this is what I mostly study, how dinosaurs came to be. And if we think about mammals, mammals have hair, we have milk, we have all these different characteristics that make us mammals and all mammals share that. The same thing's true of extinct groups. Um, dinosaurs, every group on our planet. In this case, Telio Crater has a number of dinosaur-like characters, but not all of them. And what we call dinosaurs is a little bit arbitrary. It's where triceratops-like animals come together with birds. And where they come together on the tree of life, we call everything within that group dinosaurs. So Telio Crater is just a couple branches outside, so it's like a third, fourth cousin. 
So it's close, it has hallmarks of dinosaurs, but it's missing some of those classic dinosaur characteristics that you see in all dinosaurs. Heading your way. What kind of uh, process are you using for 3D printing? Yeah, so we haven't gotten there exactly yet, but we have printed this in resin. So this was done, I think, on the form 3L, which is about this big. Um, it's, it's, in a, it's in a cure, laser cured resin. So the, the quality is exceptional, and this wasn't printed at the highest quality. Because we want to keep costs low for printing these skeletons for anyone, most of the skeleton will be printed in using the other kinds of printers, which start from the bottom up in something like PLA, ABS, something that's uh, about a fifth the cost of this. And that, that will be our goal. Um, we haven't done it yet, and we have to figure out how to cut up the skeleton to print it in a way that reduces waste of struts, but also increases the amount of detail to what we want to see, but also um, give as much detail in the places we want people to see detail. So ultimately, when the skeleton is mounted, you should be able to walk near this, look at it with your phone through your camera, and that will, trip, that will take you to this digital environment where you can click on it. And of course, the physical model won't close its jaw, but the digital model would. My mind is just blown. There's so many, there's the 3D printing and the scanning and the being able to take these skeletons that are millions of years old and just hand them to everybody. I just love it. We are at time. So I want to thank you, uh, Sterling, and the whole team. Uh, loved hearing from the students this morning. I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. And we will not be here next week because it is spring break, but we will be here the Friday after that again. Hope you all have a great spring break. And let's hang around and look at the, the uh, 3D printed skull, and there will be donuts shortly. Y'all have a great day. <laughs>